You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, and this is Six Degrees of John Keel. Welcome to the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Barbara Fisher, and tonight with us is Morgana. And tonight we're talking with Alex Matswell. She is a ghost hunter. She is an author. She does really funny TikToks that are about the paranormal that make me laugh out loud and nearly spew tea on my on my monitor. So she's good at it. She does some really informative YouTube videos, but they're still funny because I I just appreciate that. Too many, too many paranormal people are just dead serious and we do everything seriously and it's very, very not funny, but not Alex. So welcome. It is so good to finally see you in person-ish and it's, it's good to talk with you. Thanks for having me on. You are very, very welcome. Uh, you just published a book. Yes. Give us the name and what it's about. Yeah. So my book is called The Hamptonville Hauntings, and it is about uh, one of my favorite haunted places in North Carolina, the Trivet Clinic. Some people say Trivet Clinic. Um, I've heard it said Trivet, Trivet. So either way, T R I V. E T T E Trivia Clinic. <laughs> cool, cool. And I, I did edit the book for you, so I, I'm I'm giving that out. But that means I've read it twice, so I can definitely say it is a good story. It's it's told really really well. I think it was really great that you used first person narrative style because it draws the reader in. So. Tell me how you were drawn into the Trivet Clinic and and what it's like. Yeah, so I so I was looking for places to investigate in North Carolina in about I want to say it was like 2018. Uh, in the Raleigh area, it was really which is where I was living at the time. It was really hard to find places that were accessible to investigators. Um, there wasn't. There seems to be a lot of. Um, more territorial things happening in with the haunted places in North Carolina. Like there's a lot of places that have exclusive contracts with certain teams. So getting in there is getting into a lot of places was difficult. Um, so I was talking to my friend, Tina McSwain from the Charlotte area paranormal society about it. Uh, one year at con Carolinas. And um, I was telling her, I'm like, yeah, I'm having a really hard time finding places to investigate. And she's like, well, have you heard of the Trevec clinic? And I said, no, tell me more. And she basically told me like, well, it's a small clinic hospital that's in Hamptonville, North Carolina. It's about an hour ish from here. Cause we were in Charlotte at the time. And she's like, you, you know, I can give you the information and check it out. And so, yeah. So a little bit, a little bit sometime later, uh, I decided, you know, I had a meetup group at the time and I was like, you know, I really want to take a meetup group to an investigation. But again, finding places to investigate, especially a group can be a little tricky. And then I, re- and then I remember Trivet Clinic or Trivet Clinic, but I forgot what it was called at the time. So I texted Tina. I said, Hey, what was that place you were telling me about? And she's like, Oh, it's Trivet Clinic. So she gave me a contact email. I got in touch with Doug Gallagher, who's one of the owners. And he said, yeah, come on, you know, bring your group over. So yeah. Um, The first night I investigated there, I had about 25 people there, which was one way too many people. I learned that very quickly. Uh, But we had a very interesting thing happen where uh, we had caught this um, EVP from the basement. Uh, There's there's a couple children that's believed to haunt the basement, but there's one in particular we were trying to make contact with, and her name was Majesty. Quite a name. (laughs) Quite a name. (laughs) And uh, so we were 
we were trying to pretend to play a game of tag. Um, cause when I ghost hunt or I do investigations, I try to stay away from like the whole, give us a sign of your presence or let us know that you're here. I try to stay, I try as much as possible. I try to stay away from it, but old habits die hard. So sometimes I do end up going to those questions sometimes. Um, but we were playing a game of tag. And so there was a moment though, where I, or I said, <clears throat> I said, uh, touch one of us, let us know who's it. And, uh, like a couple, like a like a couple seconds later, I was like, you know, I really want to, I want to check that. So I got my recorder, I rewound it, and I re, and I listened to it. And when I said, "Touch one of us, let us know who's it," a couple seconds later, you, you hear this little voice say, "Tag." And after that, I was hooked. Like I was absolutely hooked. So, That's so cool. That's great. I love that story. I also like that you do avoid the standard boilerplate questions because I feel like I understand why they're used because I think it adds a layer of scienciness mm -hmm. to a ghost hunt. Um, but I also think that if I was a person who was wandering about as a ghost, I would not want to respond to like the ethereal version of a questionnaire <laughs> I would, if I was a little ghost kid, I'd be like, yeah, I will totally play tag instead. But if you asked like a little ghost girl, give me a sign of your presence, she's going to be like, why? Like that doesn't mm -hmm. vibe, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, which is a very right. non sciencey term. But I like that you use a more human approach. Yeah, it's one of those things where I try to put myself in the spirit shoes, so to speak. And I'm like, well, okay, well me, I'm socially awkward. You can't tell right now. Cause you know, I'm very much putting up, um, oh, what's the word I'm masking right now. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I'm, I'm very socially awkward. I, I'm kind of a wallflower actually. Most of the time I prefer to be a wallflower and anyone who's watched my TikToks is like, no way, <laughs> but you know, uh, but I, for me, I know that if I had a group of people coming at me, asking me questions, I would feel very overwhelmed. At least for me, I would. And who's to say that spirits don't feel the same way, especially these locations that see a team coming in almost every night, you know, it's gotta be overwhelming. So I try to take on a different approach to investigating where it's more so like just starting a conversation, um, telling them about myself for one, because I feel like with a lot of modern day ghost hunting practices, it's a very imbalanced exchange of information where we're constantly asking them to tell us about themselves, but we rarely tell them about ourselves. Um, and I feel like if, if we at least open with, Hey, you know, my name is Alex. I, I, I live in Virginia, but I used to live in North Carolina and I really enjoy theater and I, you know, I like to sing and, you know, I, you know, trying to stay somewhat contextual too. I'm not going to say, Oh, I like to play on my smartphone and, you know, play Bejeweled right. on Android. I'm not going to do that, but you know, just very much like my favorite color is blue or I really like, um, chocolate cake, you know, simple things like that, just to, you know, tell, tell them about us. Cause you know, it, it kind of helps break away that barrier of being a stranger too. Um, cause you know, if it's strangers asking me questions, I'd be like, okay, well, what about you? Like, tell me about you, please. Uh, or at least like, let me know who you are. So I know like your intentions are, are okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, you, go ahead. I think that's a good approach. I mean, if, if ghosts are humans or past humans or whatever is left of humans, residual humans, I think approaching them as you would approach a human being is going to yield much better results and lead to, you know, a buildup of an exchange of information and everything much better than just treating them as data would. Or like, you know, like I said, the, the ethereal questionnaire, you're, you're not doing an ethereal questionnaire, you're doing an ethereal conversation. Like it's, yeah. if I think, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit scattered today. <laughs> oh, you're good. Um, I think that's just from a, a human standpoint, I think that's a better ethical way to engage with what might be a human 
than just that one-sided exchange of information like you're saying like that mm, we yeah you don't want to treat something that was possibly human as if they are inhuman yeah yep. yeah it, to me from an anthropological view you're you're committed to keeping the social social contract that all humans in a society agree to what what is polite how you talk with people um, societal norms of conversation when you go into a, a, a place that may have been somebody's house and they're still there maybe and yell at them I mean you don't do that with people who are still alive do you, do you go in their house and holler at them and, and ask goofy questions like what's your greatest trauma or something you, 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 you don't do that <laughs> that's not cool so I like that you uphold the social contract, both with humans who are living now and possible humans who have, uh, who are disembodied, who have mm -hmm. passed on, however you want to put it. I think that's a great way to go. And uh, I think it's, a, I just think it's just really very warm and inviting. Yeah. Uh, I, and, and actually, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I wrote a I wrote a piece for a publication about this as well. But in modern ghost hunting, especially on TV, we tend to other the spirits. Like we've created like this up, uh, like we've put them in the category of the other. Um, where I think a lot of that comes from the fact that we can't see them. We can't mm -hmm. see them. We most of us can't hear them. Now I know there's some people who can, and they can see them too. But I'm basically talking about the the overall norm of going into an investigation. It's like you normally can't see or hear them. You're focusing on like blinking lights, but because we don't see them, we don't see their faces. We tend to put them as the other. And therefore we can, we do things that maybe even ourselves wouldn't normally do in normal social conversation. Like, you know, not to, not to bring up a certain person with a TV show, but it's like, I'm not going to take off my shirt and tell like the ghost to come at me. Um, like, would you, like, would you come up to a human being, take off your shirt and tell them like, Hey, come at me, bro. You know, we, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. So it seems like in the, in the ghost hunting space, we have this, um, weird, well, not me personally, but I, I've seen it in others where there's this weird like comfort level to be. It's almost like the ghost hunting version of a keyboard warrior, if that makes sense. Yeah. I was about to make that analogy. You you jumped right in there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If you can't see their faces, you can act like a jerk. You know. Mm -hmm. And that's no. Yep. And and that's and that's exactly what it is. We can't. We don't see their faces, so we tend to put them in this hole in the other. Um, and it's interesting because it's like, do we lose a level of our human identity once we like leave our our meat suit to put it super bluntly <laughs> um i mean it, i did a whole like i did a whole almost a whole thesis paper on just the fact like thinking from back in my theater studies when i was studying theater and i was looking at the paranormal in theater and how I mean, we could even say Shakespeare was like one of the first people to really advocate other or not advocate, but really start this whole othering of spirits. Um, Hamlet is a right. perfect example. Instead of um, instead of like the ghost being named like King Hamlet, it's the ghost of Hamlet's father. Yeah. Like, why isn't it King Hamlet? Yeah, it's, just, it's the ghost of Hamlet's father. So it's like there's this it seems like there is this maybe really underlying trend belief like subconscious belief like once we leave our bodies and go into this other mode of existing like do we lose a piece that makes us human or at least that piece that gives us the respect to be treated as humans so i think i think we do lose something that makes us human namely we lose life but i don't think it I think it should produce the opposite effect. It should produce an effect of res more respect and more mm -hmm. treating them more humanely than to treat them less humanely and with less respect. You know, I'm thinking about ancestor worship, for example. Yep. Like, because there's plenty of 
you know, cultural constructs that place ghosts as vengeful beings that you have to appropriate, appropriate. Um, and if you don't, they will come get you. So I think that otherness is kind of coming from a sense of fear. Um, and I think that fear can very quickly, particularly in men, also not calling out that one guy on that one show, but <laughs> fear can result in false bravado. Yeah. And I think yeah. that it can be more yeah. comforting to respond aggressively or, you know, uh, uncaringly to things you can't see than to acknowledge that maybe they deserve respect because if you're afraid of them and you're like, okay, I have two options. I can either be respectful and hope they don't do anything bad to me or I can bluff really hard and maybe scare them. I think it is going to depend on what type of person you are and how thoroughly you've thought through the situation and what your enculturation has been is going to determine which of those two paths you take. And I think a lot of people, at least in America, depending again on enculturation, are going to lean a little more towards bravado or dismissal. Mm-hmm. I was gonna. Point. I was gonna say, looking at um, cultures that do venerate ancestors, um, Native American cultures, um, uh, the uh, cultures of Africa, West Africa, I know about a lot, and then the African diaspora cultures. You know, you talk to the ancestors, and you don't talk to them like they're not alive. You talk to them as if they are still alive. And, you know, even in, a, in the Catholic culture of Mexico with Day, in the, Day of the Dead, you offer food, you offer words, you, you talk with them, you, you have a fellowship still with family. them. They're, they're still family. And I think, I don't want to say it's necessarily... But I will say, I think it's the Protestant, uh, former Protestant majority that we had in the United States that kind of, kind of pushed the ghosts and the ancestors away, you know, and and people got this whole enmity idea. Also, mm-hmm. there there was another show that that everything was a a damned demon, um, and that that doesn't help, you know, <laughs> that uh, that's a big othering. So it, it, you know, it's going to make people feel like they have to be aggressive or forward. Or afraid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, yep. I, you know, you do jump when you hear a voice right next to your head that, and there's nobody there. I mean, that happens. But does it mean you have to, you know, run away? I mean, seriously, what are they going to do? I mean, for and this is different because it's a cat, but my little old lady cat that died a couple of years ago is still in the house. And I jumped the first couple times I saw her upstairs, and now I've just gotten into the habit of when I see her going, oh, hi, Grimmy. And you just get used to a ghost if it's in your house after a certain point if it's being a, t- a chill ghost because i do think there are unchill ghosts oh yeah and i do not blame anyone for being unhappy about a poltergeist or scared or angry at a poltergeist because that is distressing that's the that's the corollary to you wouldn't go into somebody's house and start yelling at them if somebody's in your house yelling at you <laughs> you wouldn't be happy either yeah one of the things I liked about the Trivet Clinic, as you wrote about it, was that it's not one of those places where there's there's an aggressive ghost. There's there's a few you have a few little bumps along the road, you know, but mostly it's a it feels in in your words the way you tell it that it must be a welcoming place. Mm-hmm. So yeah. If you could talk a little bit about the difference between and oh this is spooky and oh well this 
this is kind of nice. You know, there's, there is a difference. Yeah. So I find that when I go to places where particular, particular, particularly, wow. Um, when I go into places that specifically have a focus on like, I'm saying trauma, but I'm really talking about like the really, I mean, all trauma is bad, but particularly bad, like terrible trauma, like Waverly Hills, St. Albans, you know, you have your sanitariums, your tuberculosis hospitals, um, brothels, saloons, prisons, orphanages, when I go to, yeah, <laughs> orphanages, oh, yeah, I got one in Gettysburg, I'm just like, yeah, oh, we don't like it either, <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> oh, so you must have really appreciated the story in the book, <laughs> yes, I did, yes, I did, <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so when you go, when we go into those places, yes, there is a spooky feeling to it because I, and not so much because I think of the ghosts that are, that could be still hanging out around there, but just that feeling of like knowing these events happened on that side, it's like, oh, that's terrible. You know, it's like, ugh, you know, you could still feel that energy and, you know, who knows if there's anything still conscious in these places, but just knowing that somebody experienced that level of trauma and um just awful events it's like it's hard to be in that space sometimes and i think that's where a lot of my anxiety comes from when i go to these types of places and then seeing the ghosts is just, or seeing or hearing or experiencing something paranormal is just like makes it 10 times worse it's like oh my gosh you know <laughs> so uh it's, you know, like if I go into Bobby Mackey's and knowing what happened to the woman at Bobby Mackey's who was tortured, essayed, um, assaulted, decapitated by these two men in the well. It's like that. Just knowing that alone is like, ugh, you know, I'm going to the Lizzie Borden house in November. I'm going to have some creepy feelings in there, not necessarily because of any ghosts that are around, but because knowing what happened in that house. Yeah. Um, but with the Trivia Clinic, granted, it's a medical facility, so I'm sure, you know, there's a level of trauma that happened there, too. Like, childbirth is particularly traumatic. Um, but, you know, people, for the most part, got their appendix taken out. Tonsils were taken out. Uh, there, was a dent there was a dentist practice in the basement, which, you know, that could be a little traumatic for people, too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but when I go in there, I don't feel that spooky, ooky feeling. I feel more of, like, I think... In a way, it's better because then I can focus more on the spirits that are there. Mm -hmm. And when I go in there, I'm just like, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I feel something going on here. Um, it's very much uh, one of the people I interviewed for the book, Jen Milby. She made this analogy, and I love it. But basically, she compares the Trivet Clinic to like the porch light being on. And when the porch light's on, you know, you're welcome to come in. And she's like, you know, the Trivet Clinic's like is like the porch light that's on. And I was just like, man, I love that. <laughs> so it's like that's that's the perfect way to describe it um, because that place and Barbara, you know, because you've read the book, but it seems to collect ghosts yeah too. yeah it seems to collect ghosts or or ghosts just happen to be passing through it um and then we know of the ones that have stayed because there's that consistent communication and uh that i mean that whole place is just a really interesting thing because you have your consistent experiences that happen there but then you have like the ones that are like oh well that's interesting wonder where that came from and I know, and I believe all the interviewees that I talk to. I believe them one hundred percent when they've told me their stories because I actually did very something very similar to what we're doing. I talked to them on video, um, as opposed to just you know I was transcribing too as much as I could, or you know, it's different from ha sending an email saying, "Hey, can you answer these questions?" Yeah. and send them back to me. It, but I I wanted to talk to them because because it was also another way for me to make sure that I wasn't getting BS. Um, because yeah. you never know. Cause when people hear their, you're, you know, Hey, I'm doing something for a book, you know, sometimes it's like, eh. um, but no, I mean, I believe everybody that I interviewed and I believe that the, the experiences that they have are that they believe they're, they're real. Um, even the ones that I haven't experienced personally, I'm just like, well, that's interesting, but they've also, they also investigate very different ways and they also have very different personalities. And it seems like when you're there, I don't know. It's it's one of those things. It's like you have a certain dynamic when you go and uh, it reacts to the people that are there. It gives you what you're going to expect for the most part. Um, 
because I've, I've seen it go from like if I went in there going like okay give me something scary it's almost like they're like okay here you go um or if I'm like hey you don't have to do anything tonight if you don't want to and then it's like oh okay we're gonna take it we're gonna chill so it's it's really it's it's interesting like I 100% that believe that that place is living and breathing on its own as a as a collective entity or it's 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 something yeah yeah i like how you talked about a few people who uh came in and they they spoke to their ancestors who had never been there and so it kind of made me wonder if there wasn't something that either pulled the information out of their consciousness not in a I'm going to grab it and take it away. No, more of a, <laughs> oh, well, this, this is what you need to hear. This is who you need. Mm-hmm. Or if there was an attached spirit going with them, an ancestral spirit that then spoke th- through whatever means you were using. Um, because I thought that was really remarkable. Um, it's just an interesting place. And one of the things I noticed, I mean, we're both, crazy cat ladies so I, I noticed the kittens first off it's one of the first things you talk about too um so obviously you're a woman of quality but to me cats don't hang out in places that are unwelcoming or creepy you know i had a friend who saw a ghost once of her best friend and it was about a week after he died and he died in a motorcycle accident She was young. She was, I think, just out of high school. And it scared her because she could see him full body as in life. No shimmeriness, no weird. He was right there and he was speaking. And she thought she had lost her mind or um, somebody had dosed her with something and she was just having this huge hallucination or it was a real ghost and in her feeling that should not have happened but one of the things she noticed was her cat reacted to him and the cat was very adamant that whatever that was it didn't need to be in the room and it basically puffed itself up hissed and sort of crab walked sideways the way a cat will do when it's really trying to look bigger and sort of edged the ghost, the figure of her, her friend, to the doorway. And then the cat was cool and would sit down and look right at it. And if he tried to move in, if he took a step, the cat would react like that and, and would growl at it and all those things. And eventually, you know, she basically said, uh, Bobby, you got to go. You can't, you, can't, you can't be here. I love you. But you got to go. I... It, I'm sorry, but you can't stay here. This isn't right. And then he dissipated, like in front of her. He just sort of dissolved. And ever since that time, she always had a cat in the room with her. She had like five cats. So that wherever she was, there was a cat. Because in her mind, they were protecting her. And I think, to to me that tells me that cats aren't going to put up with anything that's too out there, too mm-hmm. scary, too creepy, um, too bad. Uh, they, 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 they just don't put up with it. When you had the mom cats and the babies all there, I was like, they're not going to give birth in a place that's full of ookiness. They're just not. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing I love about the Trivet Clinic so much. I, I don't go into it too hard because I know not everyone who reads the book or, you know, they're going to be cat people. But I'm like, ghosts and cats, I'm in, you yeah, know, exactly. <laughs> it's, you know, anytime I go there, I'm always looking for kittens. And, you know, Doug, Doug always jokes. He's like, you want to take one home? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, don't, don't. Don't uh don't tempt me, Doug, because I will. <laughs> I will. If we can catch one, I will. <laughs> um, but they, you know, they also keep their distance from me too, you know, as most, you know, feral cats do. Yeah. Um, but I'll see like the mama cat and I'll see like the babies and um 
Yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, every time I went to the clinic, it's, you know, I always have to be careful. I make a note in the book. Yeah, I'm always careful when I'm on the driveway because I'm like, want to make sure there's no babies around. And, you know, and I'll look for kittens before I start ghost hunting. Like, that's like to me, that's another like big selling point of the Trivet Clinic is, you know, it's the, <laughs> it's the cats. Because um, there's so, because I mean, at one point when I was there, I think there was like eight cats. I mean, and there was, and like five of them were kittens or something. And I was like, Oh, heck yes. Um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. So, it, and it, it, yeah, it's, it's, and that's another I- indication to me that what's there is not evil. Like I know there's been, I, I, I have talked to some people and there's some interviews that I didn't include and not necessarily because their stories didn't fit the narrative that I was trying to tell. Cause I was really just saying, Hey, this is what the experiences are, but I am also very conscious and careful because the trivet clinic does give you what you expect i didn't want to set it up as like this demon house because it's not um and, and a lot of people tend to misinterpret fear as it's evil mm-hmm. which you know is very common in even today's society with living people you know just because they make you nervous doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil um but but it's it's interesting because you mentioned you know people talking to ancestral spirits at the clinic and it seems like to pull it it pulls out this information from you or something's attached um the first time it happened with me when we when we were celebrating the birthday of these two women that was that was remarkable that was remarkable Mm -hmm. and i never thought that would happen again until we did that ghost tour in october and this man's talking about you know yeah my my best friend, my best friend is coming through and I'm like, no way. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's interesting in that it is honestly, I think next time I go to the clinic, which is probably going to be in October. Cause we're going to do a book launch party for the book. I mean, I may be like, Hey mom, you want to come up, you know, come on, <laughs> you know, cause my mom's made herself known in a couple of haunted places, but never at the trivet clinic, but I've also never gone in with that expectation. So I almost want to go in there next time and be like. October's a good time for it because, you know, one of the things I have experienced is the veil between the worlds truly is thin. You know, there's a reason that All Hallows Eve and All Saints Day is, you know, right in there, that Samhain's Mm -hmm. there, all of that energy, all of those sorts of holidays, the Day of the Dead, it's, it's all in that that t- that space i just think that the yeah. veil is especially maybe thin at the trivet clinic you know like i wonder if there's underground under underground water sources running over quartz or something or you know if there's granite as a bedrock or if it's limestone there's so many mm-hmm. so many thoughts Sorry, that could be could be looked at yeah um yeah no you're absolutely right there's i i want to get more of a makeup of um of the of the land uh because there's stuff that happens outside too Mm -hmm. i haven't experienced it as much but you know one of my mediums one of my medium friends um she's referred to as diane in the book um, I changed the names of everybody that for the, for most of the people that I investigated with just for like privacy reasons. And either I couldn't get in touch with all of them or I was like, eh, they're probably not going to want to be named. So I'm just going to go ahead and change their names just to be safe. Um, but the medium who's known as Diane in the book, she, anytime she visited the clinic, she went around outside to talk to whoever she makes contact with and, out there it's like a man named john i think is i think is his name um where she just goes out and says hello to him and just has a full-out conversation with him and i'm like okay and initially i was like man maybe that's just diane but then other people started telling me oh yeah you know there's a spirit out there it's a male spirit who walks the grounds and everything and diane Diane's social network is a bit small and i'm like there's no way that diane could have gotten in touch with this person because they live like 30 minutes away on the other side of Hamptonville, not towards Raleigh. And it's interesting, like y'all are picking up on the same person. And it's, it's definitely, uh, and I know there's water, there's a water source back there. There's a pond that's like heart shaped that Dr. Trivette did, um, 
did for his wife for Valentine's Day one year. And oh, I think there's so another sweet. pond back there as well. I know. There, that dynamic between those two is also very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, you can make a little pawn in the shape of a heart in the back. It's like, ah. um, yeah, they have a very interesting dynamic. And I think there's something deeper going on there that I haven't quite found the information to validate it, which is, I don't know. I just have a lot of theories about it. They had a, they, well, they had an age difference that wasn't unremarkable for the time. So, Dr. Chevette was in his 30s. His wife, Gwen, was 18 when they got married. Um, so very, very young. I think I think it's like a 17, 18 year age difference, if I remember correctly. Um, so they were married for uh, up until Dr. Chevette passed away. Uh, so granted, when Dr. Chevette passed away, she was in her early to mid 30s. They never had children, uh, which... When you usually when someone's marrying someone as young, a, a really young wife, that's probably there's some expectation to have children. Uh, they, they never had children. She never remarried. Which she is odd for that time period. Very odd for that time period. And uh, she and I also have some really weird connections that I've been that kind of rattled me a bit. Uh, she passed away in 84. 84 um in a nursing home in raleigh like literally 10 minutes away from where i was living huh and i'm like well that's weird and she was buried in hamptonville um with her husband she also moved or she moved around she actually ended up in um dc in the dc area which is where i live now and i'm like well that's weird um yeah <laughs> i'm like well, that that's is strange odd. It is. It's very odd. Like, she and I have some really weird synchronicities and also the theater side of it. Um, she was more on the opera side, but she was also a singer. I was a singer. I sang in church all the time. She sang in church all the time. Um, no one else has, as far as I know, and I'm only saying this within my scope of my investigations, who I've talked to, I've been the only one that's been able to contact her. So... But also, I, I know I was the first one to come in and start playing opera. So yeah. it yeah, might be one yeah. of those things where, you know, she she feels comfortable with me. Um, I don't know. It's a very strange thing. And somebody brought this up to me as I was writing the book, but I didn't want to center myself in the book either. But someone has a th came came to me, went to the clinic apparently, didn't make direct contact with Gwen, but felt like Gwen around and they're like, she feels very familiar, like it's your soul, Alex. I don't know if you've ever done a past life regression, but maybe something to look into. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% about that. I thought it was interesting, though, when she said that our souls felt very similar. And I'm like, well, you know, Gwen was an opera singer and a theater person. So that could be, maybe it's that element. And she's like, I don't know, Alex. Just I'm just letting you know. Maybe you're talking to a fragment of your soul at the Trivet Clinic. And I'm like... <laughs> that's a whole other that's a, that's a whole other thing uh to <laughs> um <laughs> to yeah, that, you know to talk about that's a big I've, thing. I've heard that's a big thing um but you know and then i look at the similar and then but i also looked at the similarities you know in our lives i'm like well that's really weird she passed in 84 i was born in 86 i don't know um mm, mm -hmm. or we have or we just have a very similar life path um Granted, I was never with anyone that was 18 years older than me. Um, although, I'm just now getting married at 36. So, I don't know. It could, like, I don't know. It's one of those uh, interesting things. Because I talked to my friend about this quite a bit. I was like, uh, -huh, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. We need a... I was like, get, <laughs> get on get on Skype. Get on Skype. We're, we're, we're talking through this. Um, yeah, you don't yeah, just say so, something like that to somebody and then, you know, screw off and... Okay, I'll talk yeah, to you exactly. later. <laughs> yeah, it was that, exactly. It was a Facebook message, and I was like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, <laughs> hold up. We, we're going to talk through this right now. Or we're going to talk through this in the next day or two, or we're going to do it right now. And she's like, I can get on Skype right now. I'm like, okay, let's go. Um, but yeah, so it's it's definitely one of those things where I think our paths, I'm, I'm not 100% sold on that idea. And I didn't want to bring it up in the book because I didn't want it to come across as like, oh, you know, oh, it's about me. Because um, I feel <laughs> like this was more focused on the Trivet Clinic story and its history. And 
I really wrote that to baseline the activity and the history as well, because as the trivia clinic gets more popular, some of the stories are getting skewed. And I was like, uh-uh, we got to, I got to set out a baseline of what is out there just because I've, I've been here and like the trivia clinic was a brothel or there was back alley abortions happening at the trivia clinic. And I was like, no, 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 you know? Yeah. So, so I really wanted to folk keep the focus on the location and the trip and Dr. Trivet and that whole history. But, um, I feel like we're on very similar life paths. Um, except, you know, the whole marriage thing, that's something that I did not fall. And now I almost, I almost got married young. I've actually almost gotten married a few times. This one with Chris is the one that's sticking. (laughs) (laughs) Um, that's the one I'm actually following through with this time. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's probably like the biggest differentiator, but you know, I know that I know what it feels like to have dreams, especially for like the stage and, you know, performance and everything and have that just not work out. Um, I mean, Gwen became an alcoholic. I'm the opposite. I don't really drink at all. So, um, but Gwen got in trouble a few times because of the alcohol. So, it's uh so it's it's it's, she's she's somebody who fascinates me in particular and i cannot find a picture her of her at all like that's been the one bizarre thing i got pictures of dr trivette's parents i got pictures of his siblings i have pictures of his nurses and his patients i do not have a picture of his wife it's so weird and that's that's odd because if she was a an opera singer she wouldn't have been shy about being photographed no, she probably would have had a headshot or a performance photo. Yeah. Um, you know, and she was up on stage singing in church like almost every week. So I'm like, what? And like a loving I mean, husband at- who digs her a heart shaped pond for Valentine's Day would be like, there would be wedding pictures. Or, you would think, yeah. Uh, you would think. Um, picture at a party, like no, an anniversary like- picture. And. You know, she died in the 80s, so, I mean, her obituary wouldn't be that difficult to find. No photo. No photo in the wedding announcement. No photo in her obituary. Uh, not even a mug shot when she got arrested that one time. Like, that's weird. Like, that How? is odd. And I heard that one guy may have a photo because he collects, like, photos of families in the area. I heard that this guy could have a photo of her, but it would cost me some money and everything because I guess he owns it or something. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I and I just and I ended up just not having the time. But I feel like there's got to be a photo of her maybe in someone's trunk. Um, you know, maybe yeah. it's just it's maybe in even an in an antique store somewhere. You know? Yeah, it's it's the weirdest thing. Like. Now it's going to mess you up because you're going to find this photo and it's going to look like you. Oh, oh, yeah. If that that happens, I'm going to be calling Barbara like, oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, I was about to say, you better call me. I want to (laughs) know. Yeah, that's and that's that's going to be the that that would gosh, that would wake me out. Um, Yeah, but it's like I don't even know what color her hair was. I don't I I don't know what this woman looked like. But but at the same time, I on a soul level i feel very connected with her um and also she's often forgotten i mean majesty the little girl in the basement she tends to take center stage at the trivia clinic and uh yeah she's a character yeah she is (laughs) (laughs) she she has she yeah she seems to be a little bit pushy yeah but my my favorite of them is is gwendolyn because of the way you interacted with her Mm -hmm. with the music that was i loved that um i I just think that's in my experience i've i've had a lot of spirit contact with music i really think that that somehow probably because all humans have musical wiring in our heads you know we we if we can't sing it's unusual you know, I'm not saying sing on stage, you know, that that is unusual, but most people can carry a tune and most people yeah. can carry a rhythm. And uh, I just think I just thought that that the way that you contacted her was just beautiful. Yeah, I got teary eyed. Oh. 
Oh, yeah. Me me too. I was uh I was a bit of a hot mess after we played uh Puccini's La Boheme for the first time. Uh and I chose that because typical musical theater kid, I didn't really know a lot of opera and I was like, okay, opera. So I like I was pulling out like years of musical theater knowledge in my head. I was like, okay, opera, opera. What's connected to opera? Rent! <laughs> <laughs> Rent! Puccini's La Boheme! Yeah. Da, 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 da. Musetta's Waltz! We got it! Okay, let's play that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. I was telling one of my musical theater friends about that whole chapter as I was talking through it, and he was like, of course you did, Alex. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, because I was also trying to think of an opera that would have been contextual at the time like would have made sense to her and i'm like okay L- puccini's lab of women's been a lot around for a long time and that's a fairly standard opera so it's like if you don't know that it, it'd be like my my world's equivalent of phantom of the opera like yeah. we've all yeah. we all know phantom of the opera <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know uh so i was like okay i think this is safe and um yeah just that whole that whole thing and you know that last visit we had um September oh actually it was last year actually it was almost uh this weekend last year um one weekend off you know we played Musa's Waltz once again and uh you could hear this sigh just this <sighs> like very like just oh my gosh it was wonderful I was like oh you like it I'm glad you like it and you're not sick of it yet um because I think she probably only hears that song when I'm there um now granted after the book came out and more people have read it i'm wondering if there may be more like if pe- more people are gonna play opera and i hope they do i really hope they do because um i think she would like that yeah so. yeah i like that you not only treat spirits as humans but you're concerned with their likes and dislikes you know you know, you're not getting lights lighting up when she's listening to the opera, but you do get a sigh on the EVP. To me, that just humanizes the whole process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I know in, like, in today's world, we call them trigger objects. I try not to really call them trigger objects anymore. They're just objects. Um, they're just they're just things, you know. I think bringing in things that are familiar to spirits is very helpful. Um, you know, some of the best interactions we get with spirits, like on the USS North Carolina, we will normally bring cigarettes, some photos, spicy photos of pinup girls, <laughs> and a few and a few saucy photos of guys too, because you know it's a it was a battleship full of men. I mean, I'm I was like, there's going to be a couple in there that would appreciate the the photos of men. Yes. There'll be a couple. Um, And also just a little bit of, just a little bit of alcohol. We don't drink it on site, um, but you know, we'll bring a little bit of booze. And um, the first time I went to the USS North Carolina with my group, we dressed up in period clothing um, and we were an all female team at the time. So (laughs) it was one of those things where we're like, you know, we're women coming onto a battleship. This would not, this would really wouldn't have happened in the forties, at least civilian women coming on board. So we'll just, we'll, we'll make it work. (laughs) We'll just make it work. Um, but we were very flirty and we played music and danced and said, Hey, you know, can you, can someone dance with me or do you want to dance or, um, Oh, I'm waiting on the side for someone to ask me to dance with them. And I would hold out my hand and I would feel like hands in my hand and, um, you know, just bringing in some joy into it. Cause I, cause I feel like, and I'm actually working on a blog about this. I feel like a lot of modern day ghost hunting practices is is very trauma based. Um, you know, they want to talk about how they passed, or they want to talk about significant historical events, which, to be fair, are usually based in trauma. Uh, wars, <laughs> they're yeah, significant for a reason. They're wars. Um, but I, I don't know. Like, if you're getting, and I experienced this with my book one bed over when I was getting um, interviews like back to back interviews for one bed over and my appearance on haunted hospitals, I found it very exhausting, emotionally exhausting to keep revisiting that trauma. at like, all, like, like just, just like two or three times a week talking about it. And I was like, okay, I'm getting, I'm finding myself getting irritated. I'm finding myself getting emotional. I'm finding myself like not wanting to be here. And 
it was like, oh my gosh, this is what we do to spirits all the time. We ask them to talk about their trauma. We ask them to talk about how they passed, or we ask them to talk about, hey, how'd your wife die? Or, hey, you lost your kids. How'd that happen? <laughs> oh, you know? God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's some of the things I see on TV. I'm just like, really? You're, you're asking about that? But, um, yeah, but, but I feel like it's, it's so, it's based in so much trauma and just talking about trauma and I, I'm not, I'm not, for me, I'm not here for it. <laughs> it I get yeah. that. Also, it's absolutely genius to show up with booze and cigarettes dressed as, dressed in period as a group of women to talk to Navy boys because that would work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like that would have worked while they were alive and it would work. And I could see why it worked when they were dead. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And um, it was interesting because anytime we tried to talk about the war, World War II, just bringing it up of like, oh, you know, things are happening right now. And just bringing it up, not being like, tell me about Pearl Harbor. You know, we weren't like that aggressive or anything. It was just, oh, you know, things are a bit turbulent right now they would not talk about it at all it was nothing silence literal silence oh well, let's look at this picture of this lady oh my bing 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 you know everything <laughs> we like, you know that kind of like okay okay i, I see what you want to what you want to discuss yeah essentially we brought in um now i brought in some spicier pinup girls um so we basically came on the boat with uh, cigarettes, porn, and booze with to Navy boys. <laughs> I mean, uh, works. What works works. I love it. I think it's great. <laughs> it tells you that they're still human. Those, you know, yeah. that's those are, you know, all humans yep. are are drawn to sex or food or something to drink, a good time, cigarettes. Feel good, you know, feel good I mean, stuff. Yeah, mom, if if you ever need my ghost, you know a pack of American spirits and like a shit ton of coffee is gonna oh, do yeah. the trick, right? <laughs> I, and yeah. like a good book that I haven't read. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be like, what? Yep. <laughs> yep. Um that reminds me. Man, I remembered I ticked off a lot of like older generation researchers, paranormal researchers and investigate investigators because um, I had posted a TikTok about how I flashed the Gettysburg battlefield um, and got a whole bunch of responses on our equipment. Um, and it was one of those things Now, granted, I was like tw in my 20s. Um, I may have had a little bit too much to drink at like at the at O'Rourke's and in downtown Gettysburg. We were on the battlefield. We weren't supposed to. There was a lot of things I did wrong that night. Um, <laughs> but we had our equipment, you know, EVP or um, K2 meters, REM pause. We got all that. We weren't getting anything. And I'm like, we're out in an open field. We're not going to get jack. And I don't know if it was just a, a desperation of like, you know, no one's around. Why not? Um, but I mean, my friend were, well, I was with my, a couple of my friends and I was like, you know what? I just want to try something and see if it works. And I ended up flashing the battlefield and all of the equipment started going off. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, and man, some people were like, that was so disrespectful that, you know, they wouldn't have responded to that. And oh, I was please. like, um, hello. Hello, Civil War soldiers who haven't seen their girlfriends or wives or any woman since for forever. a while, <laughs> yeah. since forever, sees a pair of boobies. They're going to respond. They're going to look at and that. And also, like, mail order porn was, like, at its peak during the Civil War. So, <laughs> so I'm like, y'all. But, man, I just remembered I ticked off. So I actually got unfriended by several, like, of, very, of several older generation um, investigators. And I'm like... Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. I think there's Sorry. there's like people want people want ghosts to either be recordings that are mm -hmm. just you can p turn a button on and have them tell you their story or they yeah. want them to be, you know, the Dickens chain rattling spooky m messengers or people want them to be that very pure, like, Victorian floating lady in white. And it's like, man, if ghosts are just dead people, there are so many different kinds of ghosts that you're going to get. 
Because if they're people, they're people. That Some of them are assholes. Some of them are saints. Some of them are horny. Some of them are funny. Some of them are really boring. Some of them are like this, that, the other thing, you know? And I think... I think othering them is understandable, but not a great way to go about it. And mm-hmm. assuming that they weren't human is also not a great way to go about it. I try not to assume I know what any of them are, but I mean, it's really hard for me to do that when I've encountered what I think of as ghosts because that it's my it looks like my damn cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to go yeah. screw it. It's my cat because I don't know what else it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's nothing wrong with assuming, you know, this looks like a human or is responding like a human is feels like a human. And I do think people can feel other people like Mm -hmm. you can be in a room and not hear or see somebody coming in. And if they're in the room with you, you can tell there's somebody in the room with you. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you don't know they're behind you or something, even if they're not staring at you, you are like, there is something else in this room with me. Yeah, horror movies wouldn't work at all if people couldn't do that. Yeah. (laughs) It it would just, yeah, the bad guy would always be winning. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, yeah, humans can sense movement in the air. I mean, I think it's movement of air. Um, yeah. or change in air pressure that's that's very, you know, you don't, in your head, you don't go, oh, wow, I feel a breeze. There's somebody behind me. No, you feel someone is behind me. That's how your mm-hmm. brain reads it, and then you turn around, and there's someone behind you. Six feet yep. back, but you still knew they were there. Yep, exactly. And Maybe I suspect spirits hair can on do our that, heads too. Still. Is that what? Maybe that's why we have hair on our heads so much mm. because the smallest breezes will shift that top layer of hair a little bit. That's true. Hmm. That might be what it's useful for. Because I don't know what ba- else it's useful for besides getting in my way. Um, babies to hold on to. Because <laughs> we don't have fur on our <laughs> chests like you know other apes do to hold on to. Don't have fur on our backs to hold on to. So Remember, I got my hair cut right after I had uh, Fox. That's true. And you were like, Mom, why are you cutting your hair? It's so pretty. I'm like, because of this. <laughs> and the kid is yanking it. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, did you get your hair cut after me? No. And I regretted it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. I just wore my hair back, but you could still catch that ponytail. And that was a mm mm-hmm. So... But I also think nice. that, you know, feeling the the breeze behind you is actually useful. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind sure. of what kind of equipment do you use? Because we know that you're using I like that you use human abilities and you interact in a very human way. Um, but you do talk about equipment. So what kinds of equipment do you use? I tend to use more reactionary equipment. I guess technically all ghost hunting gear is reactionary in a sense. Um, but I, I use, I try to use, um, like motion detecting type of equipment. Um, K2 meters I'll use more so to baseline, but then on the occasion, like, you know, when Gwen is hearing lob OM, uh, and I'm seeing the K2 meter go off, I'm like, okay, cool. And that's one of those things that I don't see all the time, even like when I'm out in the field investigating some of the most haunted places ever. Um, but it's good to get a baseline of like what what's the electromagnetic field look like on the on site, um, just to get an idea of what we're dealing with. Um, REM pods, I, I'll use those. I use I tend to use cheap REM, REM pods because I'm not going to pay 180 bucks for something that I know is a junior theremin kit and it's made <laughs> out of resin and glue sticks. Um, <laughs> I love that. Once I know how it's made, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm like, ah, I can't, no, I can't do that. Um, yeah, and we'll use uh, audio recorders, surveillance cameras, um, camcorders. Uh, although sometimes I've noticed that having so much equipment can detract from investigations where I see people like 
you know, they get stuck on the screen, like watching the flare camera or, you know, that kind of thing. So I try to take, I try, I, I try to use equipment that doesn't require me to monitor it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've yet to have a team member in the last couple of years who is okay with sitting at base, you know, watching the surveillance equipment. So it's like, we all have to watch it afterwards, but, um, then we just timestamp what to look out for. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so a lot. So we use a lot of monitoring equipment for the most part, but you know we'll have the reactionary stuff like the um, the REM pod, the so a spirit box. We will use. Um, we tend to do what's called the Estes method on the spirit box, and essentially, you know, that's like you know you're blindfolded, you have noise canceling headphones on, and you're just basically speaking what you're hearing in the box. Although a lot of people will use the Estes method too as a form of channeling and they'll go into a trance state and they'll start talking as well. And it's really interesting when you have two people under the Estes method and they start like react, like oh, wow. talking to each other when they can't see or hear each other. Yeah, that's another thing I want to do at the Trivet Clinic next. Um, I want to do a dual Estes method. Um, Dueling banjos, yeah. but with people. But with people, exactly. <laughs> uh, just just to see what kind of pops up, um, just to see what happens, because I've you know I've seen people have some interesting experiences from that as well. Um, and then yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and I try not to get too caught up in the equipment because it, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm I've made a bit of a shift from like trying to record every second that happens. Because sometimes your remarkable thing will happen and the camera's not on and you're like, mm, yeah, yeah, shakes fist in air, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but also sometimes I, I wonder if like, if we're meant to have these experiences and they're not meant to be recorded. Yeah. So, um, cause man, some of my most remarkable experiences have been when I didn't have an, a recorder or a camera with me or the batteries died. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's the other thing, draining batteries that, that, that definitely happens. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it does. A lot. Do you have any favorite experiences you've had? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, besides playing La Boheme for Gwen, Gwendolyn the first time, that one's probably like my number one. Uh, let's see. I was on the USS Hornet. This was 2013. I think I was on the USS Hornet in Alameda, California. Now this was a full air aircraft carrier. Yeah, very active um, in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Um, I think this may have been like the my first inkling of like, hey, these are humans, and you need to talk about yourself too. Um, so my friend and I were in the sick bay at the at on the USS Hornet, and. Um, we weren't really getting anything. Uh, we were trying to talk to some spirits, but they weren't really, they weren't responding. And so um, anytime I'm on anything, I'm, I'm anywhere related to World War II, I kind of consider my family history a trigger object. Because, um, you yeah. know, my grandfather was a Japanese American in the U.S. Army. So I'm like, hey, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that, that could be very triggering for some spirits. Yeah. Um, or it's or they're intrigued, like, oh, tell me more. Um, yeah, so I just started talking about my grandfather, uh, just saying, you know, hey, you know, um, my grandfather served in the army during World War II. He was stationed at Fort Snelling, uh, and he was and he was Japanese. And as soon as I say like, as soon as I said like he was Japanese, all these green lights started to appear, um, and I could see them like looking straight at them. It wasn't like peripheral vision. It was my friend and I were watching this happen and I'm like, uh, I kind of start freaking out a little bit. Cause you know, we, we think we see things, but no, I'm, I'm, you're definitely, yeah, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this and I call for my other friend. I'm like, Sergi, you know, I'm like, ah, this is crazy. Um, but then my friend's like, okay, we need to turn on the light. Cause there's gotta be a light source. Like there has to be. And so we go and turn on the light. We're looking around and we're like, three or four levels down the USS Hornet. Those places are, it's all, it's a, we're in a metal box. Like, yeah. And we're in, we're in, we're in an even smaller metal box in a bigger metal box. There's nothing coming through. So turn off the light again. I get back on the bed. We lay down and I said, you know, sorry about that. I just 
wanted to make sure that you are you and uh, if you could come back out, that would be amazing. If not, you know, I totally understand. Um, but, you know, I just want to let you know my grandfather was, is, is an, he was an American. He served in World War II, very patriotic for his country. He, you know, all this stuff and the green lights came back on. They, or they, they just started floating around. Like, I didn't see anything. Of course, then that was when we realized the camera died. Right. Yep. <laughs> like, yep. We didn't even hear the do do do, you know, that the camera <laughs> would make when the battery dies. We didn't even hear that. Um, and yeah, it was just, uh, it was, that was a, that was probably one of my favorite experiences. Um, because yeah, it was the first time I was straight on, like, well, besides the car accident, the whole one bed over thing, like, yeah. that was the first time. I even then I'm like, is that was that just me projecting trauma? But um, in this case, on the USS Hornet, I'm like, I'm staring straight at this and it's happening. And it's literally I'm watching the green balls of light floating around. And uh, yeah, that one that one was. Yeah, that's probably one of my that's one of my favorites. Um, that one. And of course, Gwendolyn um, with, you know, playing Puccini, uh, her reacting to that. Um <laughs> okay i have one more uh this one's a funny one we we're at well me and my team were at old south pittsburgh hospital and uh <laughs> so we we're down in the basement and we were told that there was something demonic in the basement and you know we're doing a spirit box no we're doing an ovulus session um in reverse phonetic mode so we're not using the word bank you know it's reverse phonetic mode and the ovulus starts spouting off the names of my team members kids now this evil presence of the basement was believed to have been a pedophile in life so the fact that oh. he was saying like we were we were hearing the names of my team members kids on the ovulus okay that's not good um that's terrible so it's a super serious conversation things are getting a little bit intense and my team member come one of my team members comes up to me and she's like alex i really have to fart <laughs> like, and she's like do you want me to go outside or i'm always like you know what just let her rip like i don't care she lets it rip or she's she's talking about how she really has to fart too and we all start laughing and then you hear the ovulus go embarrassing <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i was like okay that's pretty that that was that was really funny and then of course she lets it rip and we laugh even harder and i think it just got so tense that that was the perfect thing to break the tension um but <laughs> i just thought it was so fantastic of just how it all came together it's like this really intense like ooh, evil evil pedophile presence Brr! and it's like i got a fart <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great yeah, yeah. Oh, interestingly man. the the lights that you were talking about the green lights morgana and i have seen those types of things multiple times to the point where we're just kind of like oh oh you saw those too okay yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> that's cool um inter oh, that's interesting i heard yesterday i was at the the mothman museum and uh a lady who was there uh, with us because we met a bunch of friends uh, she was talking about having an EVP no not an EVP um, a K2 which she was you know looking at the the floor of this place that was supposed to be haunted and they hadn't gotten anything hadn't gotten anything but she was doing readings on the floor of, of what electromagnetic you know mm -hmm. reading it was she was doing a baseline okay and she said she knew that there was a lot of quartz in the area, so she expected to see, you know, a fair amount of energy. And yeah, it was there. But she looks up from her monitor and a, a white ball of light that she sees with her own eyes, sort of do 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 do. It was like right in front of her face. And when she looked at it, it just went straight down into the floor and disappeared. When that happened, yeah the k2 spiked hugely and she was like wow <laughs> oh and she's like i had never seen anything like that before now the people she was with said oh you saw one of the uh the elementals 
So in in that you know context, it was considered an elemental. In your context, it was spirits of sailors, possibly. Yeah. It's a thing that lots of people see in a lot of different contexts. So in my context, I tend to ascribe them to fairies. Yeah. So literally that's what the green balls of light looked like. It was like little fairies that had illuminated and yeah, it was just yeah wild. Like, like, huh? Okay. Like, and it wasn't like aggressive or negative or anything like that. Cause I mean, I kind of took a chance there. I was like, Oh, you know, I'm talking about my Japanese grandpa on a <laughs> world war two aircraft carrier. You know? That's going to go over. <laughs> that's, well, that's some risky business. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> like this could be upsetting, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it's like, eh. um, yeah, that's uh, that's so fascinating. Um, yeah, you're actually probably not too far from where my family is. Uh, maybe a couple hours away. I have family in um, Ashland, Kentucky. Well, ca- technically Catlettsburg, which is the tiny, oh, yeah. tiny town next to Ashland. Um, because that's where my grandma's family's from. So when you said Point Pleasant and Athens, Ohio, I'm like, oh, we're oh, not yeah, far. Because yeah, you're not far at all. You're not far. Probably from my hour and forty five minutes, two hours at the most. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's forty five yeah, minutes okay. from Point Pleasant to Huntington, then from Huntington to um, Ashland is just twenty minutes. Yeah, especially oh, if you drive fast. We used to fly fast. into Huntington. Yeah, yeah, we used to fly into Huntington or Cincinnati and then drove over. But um, yeah, yeah, when uh, we would take the puddle jumpers to Huntington, and you know, and then you know, of course, when in my it wasn't until my twenties I found out about you know we are Marshall and that whole story, oh, and I was yeah. like, oh, oh, great, that's because I had always wondered, like, and that's where weird synchronicity or just feeling it. Like, any time we flew into Huntington, I was like, I wonder if a plane crash ever happened here. Like, because you get pretty damn close to those trees yeah. when you're landing. Like, you get pretty damn close to those trees or d- pretty darn close to those trees. Um, yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I was a journalism student at Marshall back in the 80s. And uh, oh, one wow. of our one of our professors, uh, Boz Johnson, had been a reporter. And, and he was there when it happened and he was walking and he was live. So he had a microphone, he had the cameraman and he was walking through what he thought was the woods because of course it hit some of the trees, knocked them down, mm-hmm. set them on fire. So he right. was walking through what he thought was trees, but it wasn't. And he could not stop talking because he really wanted to get the story out. But he said he had nightmares about that for the longest time. And he said that was the most horrible thing that I've ever done. He was also the man who, you know, he was like, okay, so he taught us ethics. And he's like, okay, if any of you are ever present in a town that has had a mine collapse and I see you on the television asking the wife of a miner what she's feeling, I will come get you because that is not Good. what you do. And actually, when you were talking about all that trauma and how that gets talked about, I thought of Boz Johnson. So there you are. Oh, wow. There you go. Journalism ethics and ghost hunting ethics. They can, they can cross over right there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Do you have wow. oh. um, anything else you want to mention before we split skis? No, I'm, I think I'm good. I mean, we talked about the Trivet Clinic quite a bit, which is what I wanted. Cause, you know, <laughs> yeah, because it's a book. <laughs> well, t- tell people yeah. where they can get it and, uh, you know, what it's like a little bit. I think it's good. So y'all should just listen Yay. to me and, and buy it and read it. For real, though. <laughs> Yeah, you should. Um, yeah, you should all grab it. It's it's on Amazon right now. Right now, it's a uh, number one new release on Kindle for occult, unexplained mysteries. Actually, it was in the top ten um, for 
overall Kindle bestsellers today too. I was like, really? Um, <laughs> it's doing very well. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised at how well it's doing. Um, yeah, you can get it on Amazon. I will have signed copies on my Etsy store, hopefully in a couple weeks. Um, if not, definitely after my wedding, which is going to be in mid-October. Um, yeah, so I'll be online, you know, if people are interested in talking more about the Trivet Clinic. I believe we are going to have a book launch party for the book in um, Hamptonville, North Carolina at the Trivet Clinic. So if anyone listening who's in North Carolina and Iredell County or Yadkin County wants to come, you know, just let, you know, shoot me a message. Find me online at the Spooky Stuff. Um Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. I'm everywhere under the spooky stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. I've wanted to talk with you for this podcast for the longest time because everything I saw and heard about you and saw of you was like, I like the way this woman thinks. I like the way she looks at, you know, if you're talking with something that you assume is a former human being, well, then y you should address it as such and be respectful. And, you know, you have always advocated for that. And I thought it was cool. So you're thank you. Oh, sorry. You're a priestess of rule zero. Don't be a dick. And I think that's an excellent thing to be. <laughs> yes. Priestess of rule zero. I love that. <laughs> I may take that just FYI. You may have it. I bestow it upon thee. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I'm going to get back to advocating for that more now that the book is done. And because um, that was a hard book to re to write to, like, because it was so close and near and dear to my heart that and there was I knew so many people were going to be reading it, at least so many people in the town that was going to be reading it. I'm like, OK, I, I have to do this right. So uh, now that I'm, I, I'm now that I'm not uh, now that I'm not dealing with that incredible amount of pressure <laughs> I'm gonna go back to blogging more and, and going back to advocating for more humane ghost hunting practices so yeah That's absolutely awesome. thank you and congratulations on your upcoming wedding yes yes they are thank a very you. cute couple too by the way oh <laughs> well i'm biased i think so too um yeah i'm, I'm also getting into the, like the last like like the man I'm, I'm getting close to the wedding stuff like it's it's happening and all the money I saved up, I'm now like put you know throwing it away on <laughs> wedding. Well, not throwing it away, but you know I just paid seven hundred bucks for my dress alterations, and I'm like, Ugh! yeah. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully, book sales will offset some of that loss. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. I'm like, <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, okay, come on. <laughs> we don't need New York Times bestseller, but we can. Yes, yeah. <laughs> come on. And Amazon um, bestseller is pretty good too. <laughs> Amazon bestseller is pretty good too. So yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's all for this week's episode of the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. If you have any questions or thoughts about the podcast or would like to come and talk about your experiences of the paranormal, you can contact us at 6djk67 at gmail.com. We promise to even answer you, and we are always happy to hear from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.